Daron's reign quickly stabilized the realm, and he soon came to be called Daron the Good by the small folk and noble lords alike. He was widely seen as just and good-hearted, even if some questioned the influence of his Dornish wife. And though he was no warrior, descriptions of the era note that he was small of frame, with thin arms, round shoulders, and a scholarly disposition. Two of his four sons seemed all that could be wished in a knight, lord, or heir. Yet too many men looked upon Baylor's dark hair and eyes and muttered that he was more Martell than Targaryen, even though he proved a man who could win respect with ease and was as open-handed and just as his father. Knights and lords of the Dornish marches came to mistrust Daron and Baylor as well, and then they would look at Damon Blackfire, grown tall and powerful, half a god among mortal men, and with a conqueror's sword in his possession, and wonder. So as Aegon the Unworthy's reign set the stage and sowed the seeds for the Blackfire rebellions via the fathering of so many of the main participants, the reign of his son Daron II was a time for those seeds to grow for them to turn into great princes, great bastards, and great problems. As these seeds grew, so did they begin to flower. The blooms took one of two colors, red or black. Hello and welcome again to another episode of History of Westeros podcast, the podcast dedicated to the Song of Ice and Fire book series, as well as George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. Not much, uh, or rather HBO's Game of Thrones, not much HBO discussion today. We were all history today. And we have a very special guest with us. Uh, let me introduce Stephen Atwell of Race of the Iron Throne. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, Steve. Tell us who you are. Okay. Uh, my name is Stephen Atwell. I write uh, Race for the Iron Throne, uh, which is a chapter-by-chapter chapter and episode-by-episode episode study of the history and politics behind The Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. I also do a podcast on um, Game of Thrones uh, for Lawyers, Guns, and Money, and I do guest appearances on a number of podcasts, including this one. Uh, mm -hmm. I also write essays for Tower of the Man. Yeah, so uh, nice string of titles there. Um, we're, we're really happy to have you on the show. And this was very fortuitous, the timing. Steve, you've been working on your own uh, essays on the Blackfire Rebellions. And as we were working on these, this podcast, it just seemed like a natural fit. And that's one of the great things about the Song of Ice and Fire community. There's good people out there that are really knowledgeable, and we're happy to have one of the best here with us today. Uh, unfortunately, there's no Ashea today. This is not related to the illness that she had in our last episode. She actually wasn't scheduled to be a part of this episode. We had planned for it just to be me and Steve a while ago, and that just kind of happened to work out for two in a row, her not being here. But no worries, she'll be back for part three, which will focus on Damon Blackfire himself, and that will probably not be too far in the future. So, let us talk about a couple other things before we get started. One other thing that Steve and Ashea and I have worked together on is the upcoming Tower of the Hand publication, A Hymn for Spring, which is a collection of essays by some of the uh, people in the Song of Ice and Fire community, podcasters, essay writers, bloggers, etc., and a lot of the people you guys have heard of before. There's essays by, by Amin Javadi of a podcast of Ice and Fire, Stefan Sasa, Stephen Atwell, myself, and Ashea. And who else is in that? I'm, I don't uh, have my Jeff notes. Hartline. Jeff Hartline, of course. How could I forget Brendan B. Fish? Um, and I guess there's a couple others who's I'm, who I'm forgetting, but it's going to be, we're going to talk about the book more. The release date is April 15th. We actually have a firm date, finally. We've had a couple of delays, but we're pleased to announce that it's coming out soon. And, of course, that's right after the TV season starts, so there'll be lots of things to have fun with. Now, as far as this episode goes, we're very excited to continue with the tale of the Blackfire Rebellions. Of course, it's a huge topic. There's a lot of different characters involved, and we've been trying to build up to it gradually by showing the people that had the most to do with putting it into the spot that it is now and getting it into the fantasy history books that we love so much. <laughs> so we're going to a few notes here on how this episode's going to work. It's a little bit uh, along the lines of something we've been talking about a while, which is getting a little bit more open discussion to mix in with our scripting. Now, of course, the scripting allows us to deliver things efficiently, but some people also like the discussion feel, and there's really no reason why we can't have a little of both. So this is, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to do a lot of that because Stephen is extremely knowledgeable about this topic, and we can kind of just go off and, and have conversations and see where it goes. So we'll have a lot of... Um, a lot of stuff that we've prepared and worked really hard on and researched, but we also have some things that we planned on just seeing what happens and how it comes out during the episode, so that should be fun. As with last time, 
We're going to call Daron the second the good, our Daron at times. Kind of like how we called Aegon the unworthy, our Aegon, because there's a lot of Aegons and Darons and all that. Yep. The name should be a little easier to handle this time, but still it can get a little confusing, so that, that warning is important. Now, um, the period immediately after the Dance of the Dragons saw the so-called False Dawn, Hour of the Wolf, and Regent's War. These were all little nicknames for these short-lived uh, time periods that followed the Dance of the Dragons. But after all these troubles were over, and Aegon III took over and started to rule in his own right, there was a bit of an interim. There were still troubles, because there's always some troubles, but there's, there was nothing huge. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of an interim period, we'll call it. The hostilities that we're aware of during that time involved aggression towards Dorne. It was more the Iron Throne starting things rather than having a lot of outside or external threats to worry about. So there may have been, while there may have been other rebellions or trouble during this time, we didn't really know of it. But Tyrion himself reminded us that some things are inevitable. I'm certain of nothing but winter and battle. So, part one. The first dragon after the dragons. This is the time period of 153 to 161. Our Daron was born on the last day of 153. He was the first Targaryen born after the dragons went extinct, the last dragon having been weak and stunted. Though the Targaryen line produced great warriors like Aegon the Conqueror, Maegor, Daemon the Rogue Prince, and the Young Dragon, there were also a fair share of men from the Aenys Baelor, the Blessed model. Instead of being tall and well-muscled like his father before gluttony overcame him, Ardaron was spindly-limbed and had a very unwarlike belly. This uh, was used against him later. Damon Blackfire, whose supporters saw him as no less than you know, the warrior incarnate, would frequently point to this huge disparity between them. It was a major piece of propaganda. But we all know better than to judge a king by how well he could fight, Robert Baratheon <laughs> being the great best example probably of that. In fact, none of those examples were shining, in fact, with the possible exception of the Conqueror himself. And I'm not even 100% sold on him. So, gods and genetics may have stinted him in physical characteristics, but think again of Tyrion, he had a great mind. Mm -hmm. So, Stephen, let's start off here with uh, a, a, something simple. Let's, let's start off with an easy discussion topic just to get warmed up. Who do you think the best three and worst three Targaryen kings were, especially uh, keeping in mind where you might rank Daron in reference to these guys and where you might rank Aegon in reference to these guys? Yeah, um, I was actually thinking about this uh, a bunch today. Um, and I definitely think sort of in my top three, I mean, Jaehaerys the I, Aegon the Conqueror, I think are easy picks uh, just because of how significant and how important they are. Uh, but I was really split between... You know, Daron and uh, Aegon V, and they kind of uh, are, are similar in a way in that they are both kings who tried to push a series of reforms, a series of changes, very far and very fast with mixed levels of success. Personally, because I'm on Team Small Folk, uh, <laughs> Aegon V gets my pick uh, for, for top three, and uh, Daron II just kind of falls a little bit short. Okay, so he maybe is in the top five, not quite the top three. Huh? Sure. That's, I, that's about where I would put him. I think I would, I would have the Conqueror maybe a little bit lower. My complaint with him is that he didn't set up his, his sons very well to uh, handle the problems that were coming. And those were, since those were pretty major problems, right. I, give him a, I take a, a few knocks off of his. But, but Daron did a lot of those same things. He, he had a lot of things that I think saw, he, he should have seen coming or did see coming and just didn't handle them properly. Hmm. What about your bottom three? So, bottom three is, hard. I mean, Eris the second is, I think, an easy, you know, he brought his house down, he tried to murder hundreds of thousands of people, uh, he was completely insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the one that I, I'm added on after reading A War of Ice and Fire and rereading the Duncan Egg stories is Eris the first. He really okay. does seem to have been someone who sort of systematically neglected his responsibilities uh, as as king of Westeros. Um, That's a good point. Yeah, and the, the, the third slot, and I don't particularly rank these, I was a little bit split between um, Aegon IV and Maegor the Cruel. Mm. In the sense that, I mean, Maegor did some awful things, and... On the other hand, I don't think we can call him ineffective. Whereas Aegon yeah. IV 
you know, it was certainly kind of less, you know, if, if we stack up the thousands of lives versus, you know, a few hundred, <laughs> you know, he was certainly less kind of uh, explicitly violent, but more neglectful and more uh, more incompetent. So it's sort of how do you how do you compare brutality versus incompetence? Yeah, that is a tough call. <laughs> Incompetent brutality would be the worst, I suppose. Yeah. But <laughs> which a little bit of Aries the Second comes in there. Maybe a lot of them. Okay, so but but speaking of Aegon the Unworthy, our Daron's father. He, of course, started fathering bastards soon after Daron's birth, and may have already fathered a girl in Felina Stokeworth before Daron was born. Now, Daron was close to his mother, Nerys, and like her, he was pious, so he most likely despised this embarrassment. And, of course, given how contentious Daron and Aegon's relationships were in the future, it seems pretty likely that, it, that they had these issues pretty early on as well. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm of a... I'm of a mind to believe that, that in most things, Daron sided with his mother and with Aemon the Dragon Knight. Would you, would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, you know, you see uh, at a, a number of different points over different issues that Neris, Aemon, and Daron uh, will all kind of agree on similar things, whether it's, um, you know, the relationship between Neris and Aegon IV, whether it's War with Dorne, whether it's the Brackens and the Blackwoods, they all seem to, to fall on the same side. Yeah, and, and with Baylor the Blessed a bit mixed in as well, of course he'll, he'll eventually die and be out of the picture, but it does seem that given personality types, these guys were all kind of natural fits. Uh, his uncle, Daron's uncle, the Dragon Knight, of course, and his grandfather Viserys uh, also would have been on his side at least in part or in whole on many different issues. But it doesn't seem like Aegon the Unworthy listened, even when, say, several of them were, you know, ganging up on him, telling him that something needed to go a certain way. But what are you going to do? Uh, so, basically, I would think that Aegon's treatment of Nerys, especially later in life with the, how the pregnancies threatened her life, on top of all the embarrassment, the, the, the sleeping around and all that, would have squarely put Daron in his mother's corner and against his father very early on. Um, he was not yet four when Aegon III, the king, died. Not his father, obviously, Aegon III, the dragonbane. And now, though a three-year-old is certainly capable of being impacted by the death of Ken, we don't really know whether our Daron and Aegon the Dragonbane had any kind of relationship. Aegon III was real kind of reclusive, and he didn't seem to have a lot of friends, and of course this was just a three-year-old kid. So it's, it's really hard to say whether that was an issue or not. So of course, Daron I was the next king, uh, our, our Daron's namesake, I suppose, and he ascended the throne and began his conquest of Dorne, you know, almost right away. Uh, basically, he was not even of an age of majority yet. So it seems that many of Daron's earliest memories would be of his family, of court, and everything, all being mobilized to fight Dorne, which is a real interesting thing to think about when you consider how much he was pro-peace towards Dorne later in life. He grows up as a child. Everyone's against Dorne, uh, except for Baylor, And that is something that we're going to touch on quite a bit. So the young dragon is really active and things would have been really busy, and then all of a sudden the war is on, and you know, a bunch of people are gone, mm -hmm. the court is emptied out, and things are a lot different. So it would have been a really interesting time for a young child to be affected by all these court things and have all this enmity towards a nation, these people he's never even heard of. Uh, Daron's father, as we discussed in the last episode, likely fought in the war alongside the young dragon and the dragon knight, and that might have been when, when Aegon the Unworthy developed a lot of his dislike for Dorne, which we know burned very brightly. Uh, it may not have been so bad early on, but eventually it was really bad. And his, his young mind would have also spun about quite a bit when he was seven, which is when the young dragon died during a parlay in Dorne. And that would have set aflame even worse, all the anti-Dornish sentiment. So... That is our intro to Daron's young age. Now we're going to move on to him as the apparent heir apparent. But first, 
We have recently joined the Audible.com partner program, and you can try them out uh, and support the podcast at the same time. Go to historyofwesteros.com slash audible trial. You can get a 30-day free trial. It doesn't cost you a dime, and you get one free download with that. Why not download The World of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones? Try out the audiobooks. That is one of the things I've done to get myself so well-versed in the material is when I'm doing chores, I just listen to listen to the audiobooks and podcasts, of course. Anyway, part two, a parent, heir apparent. Now, this would be the time of 161 to 72, 172, mostly the reign of Baylor the Blessed, also the reign of Viserys the First, uh, but, or sorry, Viserys the Second, but his reign was only about a year, and uh, there was not a whole lot of, that is terribly relevant to this episode, it was going to be covered there. So even though the young dragon was a shining star, and was the, you know, the, the pride of House Targaryen, it was for a very short time, and he was unmarried at the time of his death, and that caused a big domino effect. Mm-hmm. Baylor the Blessed takes the throne, and immediately starts making huge changes. He sets aside his wife almost right away, takes Sepson's vows, and he did his walk to Doran before this, probably. We're not sure of the timeline. What do you think, Steve? Do you have a do you have a thoughts on which happened first or does it matter? I'm a little bit uh, to be honest, I'm up in the air about that. After rereading A World of Ice and Fire, the Baylor section, I'm a little inclined to think that that part might have happened after he got back. Because a lot of his sort of "Quote unquote madness" was attributed to the the um, the, the viper poison that he uh, he picked up in Dorne. That's a good point because it when he was bitten by the vipers, it said that he took almost half a year to recover and wasn't they couldn't even get him back to King's Landing. They had he had to recover in Storm's End. And while we can't be sure that the vipers are what you know made him deranged, he you know it's not like we haven't seen other Targaryens be deranged. It's a It's a good theory. I would certainly not dismiss that. And it explains a lot of his behavior. But despite Baylor's derangement and his strange policies, Ardaron was a big fan of him. Right. But more importantly, uh, for the moment, Baylor becoming king meant almost certainly that Ardaron would become king. It went from Daron the first, the young dragon, a young and vital, likely to have children eventually, to him being dead and us having a Septon king who's never going to have kids, and even if they he did have kids, they would be illegitimate because he took Septon's vows. That meant that the throne was definitely going to pass to, well, beside the small chance that it was going to pass to Dana the Defiant. Let's skip that for now. It passed to Viserys II, and then to Aegon IV, and then to Daron, our Daron. And from his point of view, this is probably how what it would look like. He, all he had to do was outlive this Septon King, who fasted all the time. He had to outlive his grandfather, who's 30 years older. And he had to outlive his father, who drank and ate and whored his way into an early grave. So I think this was very predictable. And I would have to say that others would have seen this coming as well. I mean, what's when you think of ambitious people... What you think of people who look ahead and you can see who's going to have the throne eventually, and people who notice that Daron would probably be king within a 10, 15, 20 years, I think they'd have started to befriend him. What do you think about that, Steve? Yeah, I think that makes sense, and we know that he gathered a large group of supporters around him, especially after his father becomes king, and it becomes very clear that his father is not very good at administering the country, you know, it says that basically a lot of lords who were unhappy with Aegon IV kind of looked to Daron as a potential kind of uh, uh, beneficial influence and a future correction. Right on. And, of course, it's it's a, uh, the, the main thing here is that Baylor actually married was the one who made the decision to marry Daron to the Dornish. That whole thing started with him. And Daron, of course, would continue this pattern later in life by making another important marriage with, with the Dornish. But we'll get to that. So Princess Mariah would become Daron's bride. But this wouldn't happen for several years because this marriage was arranged when they were both very young. But So again, we're looking at a young boy, a young prince, who has seen 
how, his whole his life is is in, in a strange spot here. He has grown up seeing everything around him devoted to attacking and conquering Dorne. And by the time he's seven, he's still processing all this when it all flips. And within a year or so, now he's being told he's going to marry these people. So right. I don't know how a young kid handles that, but <laughs> but he, he he certainly did somehow, one way or another. So this is the first Targel Martel Targel <laughs> Targaryen Martel Union. That's what we'll call it, Targel. That's what a Targaryen Martel Union is from now on. <laughs> so this would cause enormous friction, and this is going to be a main catalyst for all kinds of events throughout this episode that we'll be discussing. So it's also, a, but it's also a major shift in the type of power that House Targaryen is wielding. From the time of Aegon the Conqueror to the end of the Dance, you have the Tar House Targaryen is this unbeatable family of dragon lords who anyone who thought of rebelling in the time of the dragons was kind of fooling themselves and the ones who did it they didn't really have the only ones who had any sort of real success rebelling against the dragon lords were other dragon lords so uh, the only people who really had any traction were the crazy religious zealots and we all know how that works so here's another discussion point we want to get into let's talk about some of these marriages Aegon's, Daron's and how there was some interesting kind of unusual parallels. First of all, we have the racism. People are racist towards the Dornish in the Iron, especially the people in the Marcher area, certain areas. But what's funny about that is Aegon IV's wife was also a foreigner. So, Steve, tell me, wh why was that not a problem for Aegon, for Aegon, but it is a problem for Daron? I think it has to do with the different ways that the, the Westerosi see the Roinar, if you will, versus the Valyrians. That the, the Lysini, the Tiroshi, the Mirish, etc., are come out of that Valyrian freehold and are sort of seen, therefore, as kind of quasi Targaryens. It's a little bit like the Valer House Valeria, mm -hmm. which is they're, they're seen as similar enough. And also, you know, it doesn't threaten the, the sort of internal power dynamics of Westeros. That, you know, if, you know, Viserys II or Aegon IV, they marry outside of, um, you know, they marry outside of, outside of Westeros, that doesn't change the internal power dynamics. Daron marrying into Dorne means that you know, not only is the relationship between Dorne and Westeros going to change, and there's kind of the interesting thing of, at this time, they're at peace, but they're not part of the same kingdom. So, but at the same time, it now means that the king, the future kings of, of Westeros are going to be part Dornish. So for, for people who, you know, fought in Dare on the First War, I imagine for some of them it might have looked like somehow the Martells had conquered Westeros. <laughs> vice versa. Yeah, that's a good point. Because they got and got what they wanted. The the Westerosi didn't get what they wanted, and uh, the Dornish are the ones getting getting married to the throne. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, so, yeah, and and that's a good point also about the Lyseni is that there is no enmity towards them. There is no built up enmity. There's all kinds of people throughout Westeros, even in modern times, who hate the Dornish. Because they're different, but also because of ancient grudges and thing, you know, all these old wars, especially between like the, Mar the Martells and the Tyrells and the Martells and the, and the Marcher lords. Or not just the Martells, but any the 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 Dornish lords along the Boneway and the Princes Pass. But as we alluded to in part one, uh, young, the young dragon and Baylor the Blessed were brothers in extremes, uh, not unlike Daron the Second's father and uncle, Aegon the Unworthy, and Aemon, Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. Very different from each other, but also very extreme in their own ways. These were the people that Daron the Second grew up around. These were his influences. These were his role models. And I can only imagine what it's like to have such extreme personalities of such different types as you know, around you constantly when you're growing up. I have no idea how to relate to that. But it's very clear that the one who impressed Daron the most was Baylor. Mm -hmm. uh, he took after his cousin in many ways. He wanted peace. He was, all throughout his reign, it's talked about how peaceable he was. He always preferred the more peaceable solution. That obviously reminds us of, of Baylor. He was, the piety, of course, is, is a good parallel. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't 
crazy. That's the important thing that's not a parallel. Daron the second, no, in, no uh, hint of derangement whatsoever. Uh, he wasn't perfect, obviously. He made plenty of mistakes, but he was smart. He's clearly a smart guy, and he wasn't a zealot like Baylor either. So by 170, Baylor had ruled for about nine years and had done a lot of good things, some crazy things, uh, but regardless, he still had a big fan in Daron the Good. Well, he wasn't Daron the Good yet, in our Daron. Uh, so when Daron had his first child, he named him Baylor. Baylor would become Baylor Breakspear. Not at all like Baylor the Blessed, mm -hmm. except that he was a good guy, but not a crazy Septon guy. <laughs> And not long after that, though, Damon Waters, soon to be Damon Blackfire, was born to Damon the Defiant, and Baylor the Blessed fasted himself to death. So things changed really quickly. So here's another discussion point. Let's talk about Baylor and Daron and how Baylor would have mentored Daron directly or indirectly, and how and what pieces of his personality kind of lived on in Daron. What, what do you think, Stephen? I mean, I, I get the sense that Daron kind of looked up to Baylor, but in a kind of remote way. I don't get the sense that they were sort of, that Baylor was teaching Daron on a day-to-day -day basis. That it's more that he sort of saw him as an ideal, as an idealist, as someone whose sort of example should be striven for. But I don't get the sense that he learned everything he knew from uh, from Baylor. If anything, I'd actually say it's probably more likely that he had a, a sort of that kind of mentor-mentee relationship with Viserys II, uh, with his grandfather, mm. because it was his grandfather who was kind of has that same quality of an administrator, of someone who's running the day-to-day -day and making sure that you know the government is running efficiently. You know, the books are being balanced. That makes yeah. sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and that sort of... Um, Viserys II strikes me as someone who's always trying to take that middle path, the sort of the road of moderation. And I see that as a strong influence on, on Daron. Uh, I would also guess that Daron saw so much a turmoil in his early years because of all these conflicts, and it may have left an impression on him, showing, hey, look, Baylor came in and did things the peaceable way, and that worked better. He may have just been a kind of looked at the results and said, hey, look, they tried to conquer Dorne, they, tried to, they did it with dragons, they failed all these times, and then the one guy comes in and does it with peace and it, and it looks to be working. Hey, that, that sometimes, you know, the, the influence is a bottom line sort of thing. He just looked at what was working, uh, even though it hadn't fully worked by that point. So this, but this would set up... Um, like you said, the relationship between Dar our Daron and Viserys II. I, I agree with you that it was probably a good relationship. One thing that puzzles me a little bit is that we we often see uh, the continuation of certain names, and we often see, especially in these noble houses, they re they'll use the re recycle names uh, that have been used a lot. And you would think that if Daron had a great relationship with Viserys, you would have think maybe he would have named one of his kids Viserys. Mm. But he didn't. Uh, that that doesn't mean a whole lot, but I do think it's interesting to take a look at these things. Yeah. But we'll be talking a bit more about uh, some of the some of the names and what we can get out of these things. It is possible, however, that you remember that Nerys, his mother, had multiple stillbirths. For all we know, one of the kids, one of those stillborn babies, could have been Viserys. My my pet theory is that the the first Daenerys, the Daenerys who was also you know the son, the daughter of right of Aegon, he, she was born with a twin, a male twin. How about that twin being named Viserys? Then we have Viserys yeah. and Daenerys <laughs> the first. That's, that's <laughs> it, it might also be the case that, um, huh, I mean, he might have admired Viserys in terms of his abilities, but the sort of the scandal that grew up around Viserys II, the suggestion that he poisoned his own nephew, that that sort of might have left too big a sort of, you know, in the same way that you, if you're a sane person, don't name your kid Magor, <laughs> at the time, not politically wise to name your kid Viserys. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Speaking of suspected murders, we touched on the possibility that Aegon may have had something to do with murdering either Baylor or Viserys. 
And if Daron suspected any of that, well, especially if he suspected his father or any of his father's cronies of having something to do with murdering his favorite Baylor, that would certainly put a big dent in their relationship, especially uh, because you know, there's no way for him to have proved it or to have gotten any sort of justice for it. Um, but again, even if that's not the case, there's just so many things for yeah. Daron and Aegon to disagree over and to get upset about. Let's just run through a couple of them real quick. Uh, the danger to his mother, Nerys, which we already talked about. Right. Uh, his father hating Dorne. This is... This is Daron's wife's country. His own father hates his daughter-in-law's country. How awkward is that? What else, Steve? What, what are some of the uh, others? Okay, well, there's the fact that his father uh, had an affair with Dana the Defiant. And, <laughs> that's you know, right. He's going, to, he's going to claim Damon Blackfire as his own son, and that's kind of, you know, it, it, it's sort of the reverse of you're not my real dad. It's like, you know, this is my favorite son, you know, right here. <laughs> uh, there's all of the other bastards. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I wrote about in, in the Black and Red Essays is that these bastards are not just a sort of a personal embarrassment, they're also a political threat. There's a real suggestion that some of these bastards, you know, Daemon being the, the uh, most prominent, might have a claim to the throne, and that's a threat to, to Daron II. Um, and then there's just sort of, you know, everything else, you know. <laughs> uh, corrupt, you know, massive political corruption, greed, Massive weight gain, alcoholism, general disregard for the law. You know, <laughs> Aegon the Fourth was just not a nice guy to be around. He is just not. He's an embarrassing father, even though he was the king. <laughs> he's an extremely embarrassing father. Okay, that is that is part two. We're gonna move on to the era where Aegon the Fourth was actually king. When things got worse, when Aegon's ability to his corruption and violence and cruelty and apathy for other people and the realm in general were a much bigger problem because he was sitting in the driver's seat. But first, Stephen, you just mentioned your essay series, The Blacks and the Reds, which we didn't talk about too much when we introduced you. Why don't you say a few things about those real quick? Tell okay, people where to find them. Sure. Uh, so if you go to Tower of the Hand, um, I've done a series of uh, four essays on the Blackfire Rebellions called The Blacks and the Reds. Uh, part one looks at what are the origins of the rebellion... Uh, part two looks at the first rebellion. Part three looks at the second, third, and fourth rebellions. And then part four looks at the Golden Company and the War of Nine Penny Kings and sort of what can we expect from the Blackfire cause in the future. And I personally enjoyed reading them very much, and it helped me uh, get some of my own ideas straight. Some of the ideas that you will hear today, you'll see in Steve's writings as well, and if you've already read them, you'll be hearing some of them again. It's, it's, some of these things, there's just so many angles. I'm, I'm impressed with, as, as many people as covered some of these topics, there's still new insights possible and, and new things that can be said about them. It's really amazing how, how deep the material goes. Uh, before we start part three, real quick, one way that we have been giving back to people that have supported the show when we do, when we started our Patreon campaign, we started giving episodes out early, meaning that when we record an episode, it's going to be mailed out or secret links are given out to people a few days in advance. We've started giving the episodes out early also to people who do the traditional uh, straightforward PayPal donation. So if you go to historyofwesteros.com and click on the donate button and you know support the show any way you can, we will also email you the next couple of episodes a little bit early. That doesn't include TV show episodes, because those are going to come out as soon as we make them. Anyway, onward. Part 3, Dragon Prince on Thin Ice. This is the era, the, uh, era of 172 to 184, basically the entire reign of Aegon IV. How did Daron II, not yet Daron II, how did he manage living under his horrible father, who he disagreed with on so much? Quote, in the last years of his reign, Prince Daron proved the chief obstacle to Aegon's misrule. No surprise there, right? <laughs> we already talked about how many things they disagreed on. Just imagine how worse things would have been if Daron wasn't there to kind of check his father and keep him back. Mm -hmm. So in a very short time, we had Baelor die, and a whole bunch of things happened as a result of his death, and then Viserys was only on the throne for a year, and then quickly Aegon IV ascends, and things all start to go crappy pretty much right away. One thing that really stands out to me here 
and something that, that we, Steve and I talk a lot about in, in preparing for this episode is some of the similarities between the situation with Aegon and, and Daron as compared to some other parallels that we're a bit more familiar with, say, Ares and Rhaegar. There's a bunch of parallels here. Steven, start us off. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing that we can definitely see is that both uh, Aegon IV and Aerys II were sort of known to be initially kind of charming womanizers who kind of get steadily uh, crazy as time goes on. Uh, they are both sort of become fascinated with wildfire. Uh, Aegon IV is said to be cruel, and Aerys II uh, certainly could be cruel. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, you can see examples of Aegon's cruelty and things like, you know, what happened uh, to uh, Sir Terence Toyne uh, and, and his mistress, and, you know, he just sort of generally liked to use and then dispose of people. I wouldn't be surprised if he burned a few people, too. We don't hear that, but I wouldn't be surprised. If, if, if we did hear about that later, it would be like, oh, well, shocking. I would be like, shrug. <laughs> what else? That's just right in line with the kind of things he did. And, of course, there's also the womanizing. It was Their, their brand of womanizing was different. Aegon the Force kind of kept mistresses for a while, whereas Ares kind of got tired of them within a matter of weeks sometimes or days. But, but they were both womanizers. They both also had a lot of stillborn children. Mm-hmm. Now, with Ares, that seemed to just really fuel his derangement, his growing insanity. And we, anyone who's read The World of Ice and Fire, you see all these crazy things he did in response to thinking to his stillbirths and accusing his wet nurses of poisoning the babies right. and all these just really awful things. We don't know how Aegon IV handled the stillbirths of his, of his sister wife, Nerys. I mean, I doubt it made him happy. I don't know if it made him really upset either, but he did seem to like having children. What, what do you think, Stephen? Did he have I, any I humanity? Think he was a little bit more, uh, I mean, I don't know about humanity. I think he <laughs> was a little bit more secure in his, I don't know, masculinity or, mm. or fertility because he had so many bastards that Eric good... doesn't seem to have had any bastards. Very uh, good. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting, uh, given that he, he supposedly slept around a lot. Um, so I think Aegon the Fourth sort of felt, well, you know, okay, you know, this woman is clearly not. It was less about him than it was about his wife, because he could look to all these other women and say, well, they've given me so many children, and clearly it's not my problem. Um, <laughs> but it's also the case that, you know, that accusation of infidelity is a political tool as well as a, a sort of an instrument of sort of personal. Uh, you know, frustration or, or, or dislike. Um, and that, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with kind of their tricky relation, or tricky is a, is a really light way to put it, but their, <laughs> their, their bad relationships with their, with their crown princes. That there's sort of an accusation of infidelity is a way to cast doubt on the legitimacy and authority of their oldest sons. Absolutely, and that parallel was something we weren't really aware of until the World of Ice and Fire, as far as Ares and Rhaegar. We learned that Ares threatened to put Viserys ahead of Rhaegar in the line of succession, which he technically has the right to do. That's a, This is a good point to remind people of how that works. It's a commonly held misconception that the throne just always passes to the eldest son. That's tradition, and that's usually how it's handled. And part of the reason it's usually handled that way is because it's so traditional that if you don't do that, it often results in civil war. Right. But technically speaking, the law states that the king can name who he wants as his heir. So both Ares and Aegon IV had legal right to do what they were doing. So the threat was not empty. When Daron II hears that he might get, you know, pushed aside for one of Aegon IV's bastards, he has to take that seriously. Mm-hmm. So, there, you know, there's other parallels here. There's other eras in the Targaryen line where there are some similarities. We're not going to get too deep into them, but consider just the similarities also between the blacks and the greens. Blacks and the reds, blacks and the greens, that fits nicely, doesn't it? Also, Aenys and Magor. Aenys and Magor had, you know, Magor was the kind of powerful warrior-like figure, and Aenys was kind of the weak, like, not, not knowing what he's doing kind of situation. Daron knew what he was doing, but he had the whole kind of weakling image and surrounded himself with, you know, courtly types rather than manly types, and that was a problem for anyone who perceived Daron as weak, even though he was actually pretty smart. But the first major controversy in terms of Aegon threatening to set aside 
Daron for one of his bastards was not with Damon Blackfire. Remember, Damon Blackfire wasn't revealed to be Damon Blackfire until the year 182. And we're still in the early 170s here. Damon Blackfire is only about two to three years old, and he and Aegon hasn't claimed him yet. So, what we had, the first controversy, was the Bracken controversy. Now, Stephen, tell us a bit about this. Sure. So, at this point, um, uh, Barbara Bracken is uh, Aegon the Fourth's mistress, and her father has become Lord Hand through this. This is sort of uh, a kind of a good parallel back to sort of the history of Henry VIII and the Tudors, in which kind of being a royal mistress is a good way for an ambitious family to try to get a leg up. And especially, yeah. uh, you know, when uh, Barba, you know, looks to be giving Aegon IV a son, that her father and Neris looks like she might be dying in a child in another childbirth, that they, the Brackens, start to get uh, ideas above their station, that they could potentially make Barba Bracken the new queen, and thus her son, you know, sort of retroactively becomes... Uh, a true-born Targaryen. Right on. Here is a quote that gives a good summariz summarization of how it all went. Uh, basically, once Nerys recovered, this whole plot that the Brackens had to try and supplant uh, Nerys' half of the, of the Targaryen line there was kind of blew up in their faces. Mm -hmm. Quote, after the Queen's recovery, the scandal proved Barba's undoing. Uh, as young Prince Daron and his uncle, the Dragon Knight, forced Aegon to send her and the bastard away. The boy, raised at Stonehenge by the Brackens, was called Agor Rivers, but in time became known as Bittersteel. So this would be one of the many things Bittersteel would have to be bitter about. The, the, the list is going to be really huge by the time we get to his yeah. episode, which will be part four. <laughs> but notice, again, that this is an example of Daron and Nerys and Aemon the Dragon Knight all kind of being united, sort of a a faction within within the court there, and this is a good example of them kind of working together on something that was equally embarrassing and problematic for all of them. Right, and and you can see how how bitter still would resent all of this. Oh yeah, that, you know he gets the short end of the stick in part because you know he must have looked around to himself, and certainly he probably was told this by his mother or his grandfather that you could have been the crown prince if it hadn't mm -hmm. been for Daeron, and then he can look to the Blackwoods and and Bloodraven, and say, hang on, why why <laughs> did I get exiled and he didn't? You know, why, why this unfair, unjust treatment? So, a lot for Bittersteel to reflect back on as he's slowly pushed outside of the inner circle and realizes what could have been. So when I, I mentioned that Aegon was threatening to name one of his bastards ahead of Daron, Bittersteel was the first choice, because... There were no other choices. Remember, Damon Waters was not yet Damon Blackfire. No one knew who, who his father was. So when Damon, or so when rather when Aegon the Fourth threatening to name one of his children ahead of Daron, the only candidate or the only candidate is Aegor. So that will really set the stage later. So, but these threats continued as Aegon's reign went on. It got worse. After, here's a quote, after the death of his siblings, the king began to make barely veiled references to his son's alleged illegitimacy, something he dared only because the Dragon Knight was dead. His courtiers and hangers-on aped the king, and this calumny spread. As we'll see, this, this calumny would continue well into Daron's reign, which won't start for another eight to ten years. We're not exactly sure when this... Uh, sorry, another five to eight years, and then even beyond that, all the way up to the Blackfire Rebellions. What's interesting on top of this, though, is how this grew. Basically, Aegon IV was pushing these rumors, but he, he they started more minor, but he couldn't go too far because, as we said, Aegon, or rather, Aemon the Dragon Knight and right. his own wife were around to stop him, but as these people died off... Aegon was more free to, to name these people and to give, give these accusations and to do these crappy things to his family. Uh, so, but ultimately, he never actually did anything. He never, he, those were just threats. It, it never went beyond that. But the threats still caused a lot of problems. Uh, but why? Why did Aegon never actually go through with it? Let's talk about that, Stephen. Sure. I mean, well, part of what's going on here behind the scenes 
is that there is a conflict over what to do with Dorne. That Aegon IV wants to go to war with Dorne. Daron II is very much against it. Um, and, you know, part of this has to do with, you know, Aegon IV is uh, a warrior, or at least used to be a warrior before he got fat. Uh, <laughs> Daron II never was. But a lot of this has to do with dynastic issues. That Daron is going to back his wife's family. You know, House Martell is behind Daron. And that means that, you know, even though the king wants war with Dorne, you know, he's, he's not ready for it. I mean, especially after his wooden dragons crash yeah. and burn. <laughs> he did um, very bad, yes. So, you know, any, so he knows that getting rid of, of Daron means war with the Martells. And especially given that, you know, Daron has other supporters who look to him as this kind of bastion of good government, you know, that it would mean a civil war. Uh, and that, you know, however selfish and, uh, you know, however much Aegon might actually believe these rumors, uh, you know, he doesn't feel that he can pull the trigger. And part of it, I would guess, like you said, it's he's afraid of these, of their, of his son's allies and what it might mean. Another part of me just thinks that he got his butt kicked the first time. He's afraid of what might happen the second time around, and he's lazy. <laughs> He doesn't yeah. want to fight a war. <laughs> a war might take away from his pleasures. He might not get to drink the greatest wines anymore. Like, would it? What would it do to his getting Dornish wine <laughs> if they were at war with Dorn? <laughs> Can he? Is he going to be able to sleep around as much if he has to do war councils? I don't know. I, it's funny to think about someone's laziness being the thing that's it's like, I'm going to start a war. Nah, I'm too lazy. It's just kind of a. I, I get a kick out of thinking about that. But what are some other possible allies for Daron the Second? Because it wasn't just the ones that it wasn't just his natural family allies. It wasn't just the Martells and perhaps some other Dornish houses. We have this quote that, that sheds some light on it. While some, rather, while some took advantage of the king because of his corruptible nature, quote others who condemned the king's behavior began to flock to Prince Daron. So it was also just a matter of honor. Not everyone is just ambitious and out for themselves. A lot of people are, maybe even a huge percentage. But there's still good people. There's still people, at least openly, who are not going to just be lickspittles and follow this awful king and, and back him. So Daron got a lot of allies just because his father was so awful. And some of these allies were powerful, like his own mother and... Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, very uh, important people. Who are some other ones that you think of, Stephen? I, mean, I think the best candidate is, is House Aaron of the Vale. Um, they're a great house, which makes them very powerful. Uh, they're also traditionalists. You know, they're, uh, they sort of, you know, their motto is as high as honor. Yeah. You know, they take the sort of the, the traditions of honor and, uh, you know, gentility very seriously. So they would kind of look down on uh, Aegon IV, who is very dishonorable in his behavior. Um, and it's also the fact that they are tied into the line of succession as well. Every Targaryen is part Aaron. So they have this sort of uh, built-in uh, built allegiance to the family, and they don't want to see the traditions of succession uprooted so that Aegon IV can make some bracken, you know, <laughs> right. Queen. <laughs> so I think that would be sort of your best bet, or like ally number one that probably was on Daryl's side. That makes sense. And there would have been, of course, a, a smattering of Crownlands houses and some other Dornish houses. There'd be people on both sides. We can't know for sure. We don't know who a lot of these lords were, and, and who knows what the ambitions of people at this time were. But... We can certainly cover it with broad strokes. We can certainly detail what the main point, the political points were, what types of things people would have been aiming for and what might have pushed them to one side or the other. Just as there were people who Aegon pushed away by being who he was and how Daron acquired allies because of who he was and his family ties, that led to another domino falling. There were plenty of houses strongly disposed towards disliking Daron for who he was. Now, people disliked Aegon because he was corruptible and terrible, but Daron, there were people who didn't like him either. This was a problem for him as the heir to the throne, and Aegon IV, not a total idiot, capitalized on this as well. Quote, 
using the hatred for the Dornishmen that still burned in the marches, the Stormlands, and the Reach to suborn some of Daron's allies and use them against his most powerful supporters. So we have lords and knights already taking sides, and now things start to get divided even more. You can really see that even though we're still quite a ways away from the Blackfire Rebellion breaking out, people are already taking sides. The battle lines are already being drawn. So that, I think that's really interesting. And, yeah, as, it's, it's, not, it's not blacks and reds yet, but it's, it's the king's party versus the prince's party. Yes. You're either in one camp or you're in the other. And eventually the, the king, people in the king's party... A lot of them are going to turn into the blacks, the future blacks, and a lot of the ones who are with Daron are going to be the ones that stay loyal to the throne, and uh, they'll become the Reds. There'll be some crossover uh, as time passes. People will always find time, reason to switch, and certainly some lords will die, and their heirs will have different attitudes than their fathers. And of course, late in uh, Aegon the Fourth's reign, Aemon the Dragon Knight dies, and Nerys dies a year later. That would have perhaps weakened Daron's position at court. Some of his most important allies were, were dead. Neither of them were had, had died of old age, of course. Nerys died of just being weak and, and sickly and having all these pregnancies. And Aemon, of course, died tragically saving his unworthy brother from the Toins. So, one of the biggest questions of the Blackfire Billions in general is... What are the actual chance? Like we kind of have been taking it a bit for granted the possibility that Ares or Ares that Aegon was lying. We just sort of assumed that Aegon was making it all up. Steve, is there any chance that Aemon the Dragon Knight was actually Daron's father? Well, here's the way I look at it. I mean, I know a lot of people don't believe this, but the way I see it is, it's it's pretty clear that Nerys and Aemon loved each other in a way that went beyond the usual brother-sister thing. Um, and while the argument is often used that a perfect knight like Aemon the Dragon Knight would never violate his vows, one of the things that if you look to sort of real-world chivalric romance and you know Arthurian myth is that often perfect knights do have this kind of fatal weakness of love that you know, Lancelot was supposedly the best knight in the round table, and he still betrays King Arthur with uh, Guinevere. And Very good point. And brings the fall of Camelot. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's 100% either way, and I, don't th I think that's kind of a problem, is that there was doubt but no way to tell, and that part of the reason why Aegon IV never pulled the trigger on this is that he was never quite sure. Hmm. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I mean, this is a world without DNA tests. <laughs> brothers and sisters anyway, so it would be incredibly difficult to tell even with that. So, you know, without a witness, how do you prove that, you know, Neris and Amon did or did not sire uh, Darren? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. There's a couple, two points I want to add to that. Just because Aegon the Unworthy was such a asshole who slept around and had a lot of bastards. That doesn't mean that thing we're not told the truth of Aemon the Dragon Knight a little differently than is, than is accurate. Like you said, the Lancelot example is perfect. But it goes beyond that here as well because the Targaryens wrote history. History is written by the winners. They're not going to say bad right. things about the great Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. If, if he had dirt you know, if he had skeletons in his closet, if there were things he did that were covered up, the Targaryens would probably keep it that way. They don't, other than Aegon himself, the brother who wanted to shame Aemon, there's, who would want to throw shade on the memory of this great man when they're all related to him? They want to say, hey, I'm related to Aemon the Dragonite. He was my ancestor. That just gives honor to anyone who, who makes that claim. We all know how big a deal ancestors are in, in Westeros and in medieval times. So, it's quite possible that what we know about Aemon the Dragon Knight is at least a little bit slanted towards him being so perfect. It, it does. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't really that perfect. That doesn't mean he cheated, slept with his own sister. But eh, it's, yeah, it's I mean, it's, doubt. You know, it's. Uh, I think part of the thing that we also have to keep in mind is that this is George R. R. Martin, right? <laughs> he doesn't make perfect people. You know, That's very true. Or he d and he doesn't make total villains either. You know, Aegon the Fourth was a bad person in a lot of ways, but he was not a kind of mustache twirling villain. He had <laughs> motives. He had, you know, 
things in his life that he cared about. So, you know, that, that motivated him and drew, and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, caused him to do things. So, you know, I don't think he acted, you know, because for the evils. He didn't do it for the evils. <laughs> right on. So Daron spent his final years on Dragonstone, uh, I guess after this time when he lost some of his allies at court. He also by this time had pro all of his sons were born by this point. We're going to talk about his sons a lot uh, in the next section. But they were all born by then. There's four of them. So he had his own family. His father was just getting worse and worse all the time and he lost his allies. So he just stayed spent more and more of his time on Dragonstone, away from his father, maybe thinking that the, the more distance between them, the less friction there'll be. Maybe his father threatened him more often when he was around. Maybe just his presence was a problem, and maybe just by separating the two, it kind of let things calm down a bit. However, it, it's from all appearances, Aegon IV was still talking, was still making threats and, and calling other, you know, threatening to set Daron aside, certainly not doing anything to stop the gossip. But he did die at age 49, and what we wonder, this is an interesting question I have, how much time passed between this deathbed legitimization of all his bastards and the actual his actual death and Daron's coronation? Deathbed doesn't mean you know he's gonna be dead within a couple of hours. You can be on your deathbed for a month. You yeah. can be on your deathbed for longer. And Aegon, from all accounts, Aegon the Fourth died very gradually. He didn't just well, you know croak yeah. of a heart attack one day. He had those crazy flesh worms growing yeah. in him. It's disgusting, but sounds like a slow death. Uh, so that's a good question. Was Daron? Do you think Daron maybe had some time to prepare? Do you think he knew in advance about any of this? I'm a little skeptical, just because, I mean, if he had a lot of time, I think he would have had a better strategy. He just seems yeah. smart enough. I think this was something that he just did not expect to happen, um, and then just kind of had to deal with it on the, on the spur of the moment. Yeah, that's that. That makes sense to me. I, I picture, you know, I picture Robert Baratheon and G.R. Mormont and their their deathbeds were kind of quick, uh, relatively speaking, and they made their dying wishes, you know. Take care of you know rule for me, Ned, or you know make sure Jorah takes the black. All those things, those were a bit more uh, noble requests than um, you know make all my bastards Targaryen. <laughs> so yeah, either way, though, if we're, if we're following kind of historical parallels, uh, one of the things about Henry VIII on his deathbed is that he changed his mind really fast and, oh. and repeated. He made a lot of wills and sort of oh. you know he would seem to die and then seem to recover and then seem to die again. So part of the issue may have just been uncertainty that, that, you know, up until he finally croaked, no one was exactly sure what his sort of the last will was. You know, <laughs> that there may have been previous drafts, and he may have made, you know, given orders and then countermanded orders so that there was sort of an uncertainty about what was going to happen. Well, that's interesting. I did not know that about Henry VIII. That's really cool. Um, okay, so we're about to move on to part four. In the meantime, real quick... A couple, I guess a couple months ago, I was told by our Hand of the King, Cash Craig, that he was having a lot of fun with the Telltale Games, Game of Thrones uh, games. And so we tried them out on his recommendation, partly because he mentioned that they had some really cool flavor for the world. It it's actually does a good job of capturing the feel of Game of Thrones, and of course some of the Game of Thrones actors do voices for it. Have you tried the games out, Steve? Uh, I have. I'm way behind. I did episode one. Okay. Uh, and I need to do episode two and three. Uh, I I kind of didn't like how I did episode one. There were certain <laughs> like, I wanted to ask more about the North Grove, and I wanted to like make sure that this character was in this place or that I grabbed these things. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is like go through and get the 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 run through that I really am sure that I want mm -hmm. before I do episodes two and three, and then I'm going to do a write up on Race for the Iron. Oh, cool. We, we just played, Shay and I played uh, part two just about a week ago. We had a lot of fun with it. We haven't tried part three yet. And yeah, I recommend it, folks, if you're, if you're looking for a game. You can play it on your phone, so it's, it's kind of fun to be able to just do it out and about. You can get it through our site, uh, www.historyofwesteros.com, and in the bottom right corner there, we've got links to purchase the Telltale games. They're uh, only like six bucks each, so it's a pretty good deal. Anyway, let's moving on to part four, cleaning up. The Unworthy Mess. This is the period of 184 to 187, roughly the basically the start of King Daron II's reign. Uh, reign. 
in in a world of ice and fire, the world of ice and fire rather, we have Maester Yandel, who states, "Quote: He was conscientious in his duties to the realm and sought to stabilize it in the wake of Aegon's deathbed decree." So the Maesters give Daron some credit for you know, trying to do his best, and in some cases, he did a pretty good job. I would say he did a good job overall in identifying where a lot of problems were. I think he was good at finding the problems and attacking them, although he didn't always have the right solution. I don't think he was it, was... it was... I don't think there were any cases of where he just didn't want to deal with it and it got out of hand. I think he either tried to deal with it or dealt with it and did a, did a good job or dealt with it and didn't do a good job. I don't think he was ever lazy like his father. I, I, maybe the kind of a... maybe a bit of a Tywin parallel with... Tywin's father was you know, obviously a week yeah. and people laughed at him and that kind of made Tywin hard and worked harder. That, that really impacted his personality. Maybe there's a bit of Daron, we're seeing a bit of Daron there. He wanted to not be lazy and corruptible like his father was. Do you think there's any merit to that, Steve? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I mean, he certainly, you know, wanted to, uh, to start his new administration fresh and kind of sweep out uh, the old administration with a, with a broom. Yes. Uh, so he started, in fact, by doing that exact thing. He started by removing all the members of the King's Small Council and replacing them with men of his own choosing, most of whom proved wise and capable counselors. It was a year and more before the City Watch was similarly repaired. So he had to think of how awful Jano Slint was. It was probably right. some sort of Jano Slint type figure. Uh, we, we hear about all the things that Janos did. Even later in the books, we hear about a few of the horrible things he did, about how a lot of the guys, a lot of the highest officers were giving him part of their pay, and that was the price of their promotion in the first place. When someone just corrupts so many people in an organization like that, you can imagine how long it would to, to fix yeah. that. What, what, what do you think about that, Steve? What is well, the I mean, especially, process you know, there? If, if you think about it, um, you know, Janos Slint was just the commander of the, of the gold clothes, and he caused yeah. a big problem. Littlefinger was just the master of coin. And he caused, you know, he has an enormous number of people, you know, an enormous amount of corruption under his belt. Yeah. Imagine what happens when starting from the top, when the king himself is just openly corrupt. I mean, it really must have been sort of a root and branch problem. That just like, you really have, how do you, how do you maintain day-to-day -day sort of uh, stability and continuity in government when you need to replace everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. And it's it's interesting too because the more the longer that state of affairs went on, the harder it is to undo it. Now, I'll use the term do gooders. So do gooders like Daron here would all are always gonna make foes who of those who thrive on corruption. And that's we had egg on the fourth reign was all about that. Littlefinger would hate Daron the Second, like he isn't a big fan of Stannis. Is being, the idea of Stannis becoming king? I bet Littlefinger would have completely thrived like Matt under Aegon the Fourth. It's the perfect king for him, a king who doesn't care, who's this corruption he shrugs at, and Littlefinger would certainly know how to play up to <laughs> Aegon the Fourth's uh, desires of being a brothel owner and all. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, we even hear that that. That's part of what Aegon the Fourth did with the City Watch was was having them arrange things at brothels for him, and that sounds like there was often you know violence and, and intimidation involved. So the list goes on. So um, these are people who never should have had these jobs in the first place. But we know human. We know how people are. Once someone has tasted power. It's hard for them to give it up. And so Daron was just rooting all these people out that never should have been in charge in the first place. But the fact is they were. They got a taste of that power. They want to get it back. And the way to do that is to support anyone else who isn't Daron. Anyone who isn't him, ha at least they have a chance of getting it back into it. So, Stephen, what do you think? Some of, some of the top people here, what do, you, what do you think of what they might have done, and maybe some examples of who these people that he pissed off were. Sure. Uh, so I think one good example is the Lostons. Oh, yeah. Um, because, you know, they had gotten their power through Aegon IV, through, you know, basically, uh, you know, pimping out their, their own daughters to, to get her and all. <laughs> daughters, plural, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, so I definitely think the Lostons... Um, the, you know, an interesting case where it didn't happen, and I've always been curious about why it didn't happen, is uh, the Hand of the King. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm uh, blanking on his name. Uh, Butterwell. Lord Butterwell. Lord Butterwell. Uh, you'd think that, you know, that would be the most sort of obvious place to start, but, uh, you know, Aegon was certainly corrupt, but you can be corrupt and still be good at your job. So maybe it was sort of a case of, you know, he was just good enough at his job to avoid that, that broom. <laughs> um, now, the, the really interesting case, and the sort of the most ambiguous case, is, is that of Sir Quentin Ball, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. Fireball. Yes. He, we'll give a quote about him real quick. This, this quote also kind of explains what went wrong. Quote, King Aegon promised to raise him to the King's Guard, so Fireball made his wife join the Silent Sisters. Only by the time a place came open, King Aegon was dead, and King Daron named Sir William Wilde instead. Now, Fireball wound up being Damon Blackfire's most valuable commander, with maybe the exception of Bittersteel. Uh, we'll talk more about him later. But for now, was this a huge mistake that Daron made, or was it maybe did he have some concerns about Fireball? What do you think? Well, this is the interesting thing about Fireball. I mean, he's known for having a, a fiery temper, quite literally. Yes. So it could be <laughs> that it was just a personality clash, that, you know, a, a more peaceable sort of, uh, you know, rational monarch might not have gotten on with such a passionate uh, uh, knight like Fireball. But, you know, in terms of what Fireball's job was, you know, he was the master of arms at the Black Keep. He was clearly very good at that because a lot of the people that he ended up training, you know, Damon Blackfire, Baylor Breakspear, Bittersteel, mm -hmm. etc., they, they went on to become very good warriors. And it may be that it was just a case of, of uh, you know, guilt by association. That because Fireball was friends with Aegon IV, that must mean that he was, you know, a bad guy and corrupt, and therefore he doesn't get this post. I think yeah, ultimately, yeah I think ultimately it, it probably was a mistake that, you know, he got rid of someone who, you know, in terms of what the actual job of being a Kingsguard is, was probably good at his job. That's true, and there's possibly a political element as well. Now, we pointed out maybe Daron just didn't realize how problematic this change would be, how what an enemy he would make in Fireball. It's easy to, to, to say, okay, he didn't see that coming. Who could have seen that coming? Who could see, who could see this guy becoming the top, one of the top generals of the Blackfire? Well, maybe someone could see that. But if assuming that, that we give him a pass on that, there's a couple other things. Possibly it wasn't so much that he was worried about le leaving this man disgruntled. It may, there may have been a political reason for naming Sir William Wilde over him. We, we right. don't know this. But, of course, as we're about to see, this section that we're entering into is Daron making peace through marriages. That's a very common trope and a very common strategy is you make you, you, the people who get you into power, you give them positions within your new regime, uh, and they're loyal to you, they've already shown their loyalty to you, and their loyalty is both rewarded and continued because you've brought them along with you and given them a piece of, uh, a piece of the power. William Wilde is from a Stormlands house. The, the right. Wilds are, are from the rain, are from rain House in the Stormlands. The Stormlands is not a marcher house. I'm sorry, the, the, the rain House is not a marcher house. But the Stormlands still, in general, are not so happy with the Dornish. They're kind of not maybe as bad as the Reach in this part of the Stormlands, but in general, the Stormlands are ancient enemies of the Dornish, so it might have been kind of throwing the Stormlands a bit of a bone, saying, hey, look, I'm naming one of your own to the Kingsguard, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering you guys, I'm showing you that you're on my side, etc. So it may, there may have been some politics yeah. involved there, and, too. And, and House Wild is, you know, House Wild and House Ball are both from the Stormlands, but the, the Wilds are much more important than the Balls. The Wilds yeah. are... You know, they they have a named castle under their, you know, under their house, whereas the balls are just a knightly house. Right, so right. He just sort of said, you know, I need this, this job, this office, this reward for a more important house. Well, now one of the other major problems, apart from all these awful counselors left in place, all these corrupt individuals that got their appointments through Daron's terrible father, there's the other problem that had lingered over his whole reign and during his father's reign, which was, of course, the question of his legitimacy that was built up through his father's rumor-mongering. And, of course, we know how everyone loves gossip. The, the story of 
Daron not being his father's son is a lot juicier and more interesting than oh everyone's just their own father and you know there's no <laughs> no questions of paternity at all that's not interesting but we don't get to decide the basis of reality based on whether something is interesting or not the point is though that Daron was well aware of this problem and he attacked it but like he attacked a lot of these other problems quote he chose to be crowned with his father's crown a decision likely intended to quell any remaining doubts about his legitimacy. So here's another parallel we have to the modern timeline of A Song of Ice and Fire. We all know by now, given Joffrey, Tommen, and others, how important this legitimacy is. It's a huge problem for any contender for the throne to be seen as illegitimate, or any sitting king to have these questions hanging over them. Daron's children, uh, of course, as well, are cast out just by their association here. They're, if Daron is removed from the line of succession right. by virtue of him being revealed to be a bastard, that would throw his own sons out of the way as well. Uh, now, Daron's children, however, thankfully for him, they were a big plus for him. They helped him keep his line and helped him majorly fight against the Blackfires. Quote, a, rather, a young Sir Duncan the Tall thinks, quote, the line of the Dragon Kings had almost died out during his father's day, but it was commonly said that Daron II and his sons had left it secure for all time. So let's look at these line-securing sons, so, so to speak, of whom there were four. We only know the birth date of one of them, which we already talked about, Baylor Breakspear, born around 170, and we have, about our, we have a loose range for the other three. Between 171 and 178 for the other three, we don't know exactly. Eventually, perhaps those dates will come out, but it's not terribly important. Mm -hmm. Three of them were, would, would be Prince of Dragonstone eventually. The only one of those would sit the Iron Throne. The, uh, the fourth would sit the Iron Throne, having never been Prince of Dragonstone, which sounds weird, but that's just because of the Great Spring Sickness, where just a whole bunch of people died at once. Uh, but more to the point, three of the four sons of Daron would have children of their own, so they did keep the line going. They did keep it secure, as they said. Quote, the eldest, Prince Baylor, won the name Breakspear at the age of 17, following his famous victory at Princess Daenerys' wedding tourney. He defeated Daemon Blackfire in the final tilt, and his youngest son, Prince Makar, seemed like to show a similar prowess. Stephen, what do you think about that? Do you think that, that victory when they were both 17 is around 187? How, how big a deal do you think that was? I think that was probably a huge deal. I mean, for, for Daemon, it would have been a sort of a symbolic protest of the, the marriage, a way to sort of, you know, show that he was the champion and that Daenerys was his sort of uh, queen of love and beauty. Yeah, that's what he would have given it to. <laughs> wow. Um, whereas, you know, with, with Baylor sort of defeating him, it's kind of a sign that, you know, this, this union of, of uh, Targaryen and Martell is going to succeed, is going to, in fact, defeat the older, uh, you know, Targaryen line, because, you know, both, you know, Daemon, uh, sorry, Baylor himself is a product of a marriage between a Targaryen and a Martell, and here he's saying, we're going to have another union of Targaryen and Martell. Yes, and a much bigger one, too. It also gives us a sense of how outstanding these two really were. I mean, these guys, we, we, we know that Damon, uh, people, the way people talk about him, one of the greatest fighters of all time in Westeros, but Baylor beats him, and Baylor was also considered one of the finest knights of his era. Uh, so he's clearly no slouch. He might be just a, almost the equal or perhaps beyond Damon Blackfire, but never, but just was a lot less flashy and was never a contender for the throne other than being an heir who died before he got his chance. Uh, there's another comparison here that I want to talk about, and the pro one of the problems with Baylor, and this this takes us back to what we were talking about before with the different races of Daron's, the ethnicity of Daron's wife being Dornish, and the ethnicity of Aegon the Fourth's wife being Lysine. Even though they're both foreigners, we talked about how there's much more of a predisp predisposition towards a Dorn and, and a negative one, in fact. Well, this problem really manifested with Baylor because he looked. Dornish, despite being a great fighter, despite being honorable, noble, and attracting lots of followers, he looked Dornish, and that's just sad. It's just it's basically just straight racism. What do you think about that, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of the issue is that, you know, um, 
there have been accusations of bastardy before. You can go all the way back to, to Anus Targaryen, mm -hmm. right? But as long as you had the dragons, there was always kind of an ultimate DNA test, right? Yes. Dragons. Like Ra Rhaenyra's kids, yes. Yeah, Rhaenyra's kids, sorry. Like, you know, if you, if you could get the dragons to recognize you, then there was no question that you were clearly a Targaryen. Yeah. <laughs> Baylor couldn't do that. Yeah, there were no dragons, exactly. <laughs> so that would have been a way to get overcome that problem, but like you say, they didn't have that option. So he just had to be amazing, and he was, but it still wasn't enough. Um, so he didn't he didn't have what Rhaenyra's kids, and Rhaenyra's kids are even more blatant, because Rhaenyra, Queen, you know, Princess Rhaenyra, she was looked Targaryen, and her husband looked Targaryen, mm -hmm. but her three kids, her three strong children look had brown hair. <laughs> it's like, how do you, how is that even possible? Well... The only explanation would have been, besides the obvious that they were not really uh, their father's children, would, we have, they'd have to play it off as their veil, her mother being from the veil or something. Kind of thin. Anyway, uh, the next child would be Ares, Daron's second child, Ares. He was not particularly impressive. He was, in fact, had he been the first son, it, might, it really probably would have exacerbated uh, Daron's problems with securing his throne. Because he was bookish, similar to his father, he was really interested in arcane stuff, higher in the higher mysteries. He, although he, we don't hear him being pious at all. We hear this is one very minor quote here from Jamie of all people. Quote: The realm had not had a Lord Confessor since the Second Daron, and Lord uh, Confessor is well, actually what? the Lord Confessor is not a religious position. Oh, okay. The Lord Confessor is an official torturer. Uh, oh. So, Interesting. Yeah, you're right. Confessor, of course, forcing people yeah. to confess. I miss. But, I, um, Dick, but you're right. the thing about Eris that's interesting is that you you'd think that someone with his interest might have done something similar to what uh, uh, later uh, Aemon Targaryen will do. Like, why didn't he join the Maesters, for hmm. example? Yeah. I mean, it may be that his you know, that Daron kind of looking at his dynastic situation said, "I need this kid around." as a symbol of, you know, if anything happens to Baylor, there is another kid. And, you know, that I can use him as a, a marriage piece and make right. sure that, you know, I get another ally. So, you know, he may have actually wanted to be a, a, a maester, and that might explain, uh, you know, what, what went on with his marriage. So the next child would be Rhaegel, and Rhaegel was even, as unimpressive as Ares was, Rhaegel was even less impressive. He's a kind of a poster child for insane Targaryens, but harmless, thankfully. He wasn't Magor or Aryan Brightflame, but he was apparently known for dancing naked in the halls of the Red Keep. So. And he might be the Targaryen who dressed up a, a monkey uh, in his dead son's clothes. Agree, yeah, that's, that's the best guess that I've seen for who that one was. Uh... Now, the final son of Daron was Makar, and we, we've probably all heard of Makar. He's the most famous, most certainly, because he's the one that the line continued through. And he was also a, a fine warrior himself, and he was the most Targaryen-looking. Uh, and thankfully, no, none, of Daron named, none of Daron's children were also named Daron. That saved us a little bit of a headache. <laughs> Though I guess it would be too much to expect that none of Daron's grandchildren would be named Daron. Uh, in fact, Daron II, his last son, Makar, again, uh, did have, uh, did name his firstborn Daron. Not Daron turned out to be Daron the Drunkard. Right. But Makar did, of course, also father Maester Aemon and Aegon V. So, overall, his son, his sons were real divided. You got Daron the Drunkard and Arian Brightflame. And then you have Maester Aemon and Aeg. Yeah. Like, that's a, poof. That's it's, feast it's for that family. that coin there. getting flipped. <laughs> yes, that's definitely true. <laughs> so, Onward. Uh, now, the, there, there's a little something to be said about their names. I don't want to get too deep into this because it's just really esoteric, but uh, Makar, rather, Baylor Breakspear named his children Valar and Mataris, which those sound vaguely like Valyrian, but there's no A-E in them, which is so common for Targaryen. Now, that's not going to... like People of the era aren't going to know that. I mean, most commoners can't read or spell. They have no idea about what these, these naming exactly. conventions. But from our perspective, it's, just, it's, it's an interesting academic question. We wonder if that's if people saw that as even more dornification of the court, or if it was if these are actually traditional names. We just we don't have prior examples of those names being used. What do you think about that, Steve? Do you think there's anything to that? 
Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not sure. You know, uh, Valar sounds a lot like Valar. Yeah, uh, Mataris sounds a lot like Montaris. Yep. The same. These seem pretty Valyrian to me. They may not be Targaryen names necessarily, but they do sound like Valyrian names. Yeah, that's true. So it might have that might not have been a problem, but it's interesting to look at now. Let's turn our eyes to Daron II's marriage strategies. As I said before, the way he sort of paved the, the road to peace was through a series of marriage alliances, not just, not just his own with his, to his Dornish wife, but with his sons and some other members of his family. So basically look at from, look at from the perspective of, of outsiders as well. Marriage to a royal family is highly sought after. Even if you're maybe not a big fan of Daron II, you you're, you might be flexible enough if you had a chance to marry into his family, because that's the royal family. Uh, basically, a king who makes good choices with his marriages can really stabilize the realm. On the other hand, bad marriage choices can have the opposite effect. Marriages do mean powerful allies, uh, a strong and a strong king can get more done. When a king doesn't have to worry about rebellions and discontent, he can take a strong, firm hand and, and remake the realm the way he wants, for better or worse. That has played out a number of ways in Targaryen history. So let, let, real quickly, let's talk about how marriage has been used in the past in the Targaryen dynasty. We have a variety of examples. Harry the Conciliator had 13 children. My, uh, my world of ice and fire here. Right on. Uh, Jaehaerys, like I said, had 13 children, so he was, as we have said multiple times, we would consider him the best Targaryen king, and he was able to make marriage alliances, and he did a good job of it. Of course, it helps to have 13 children to marry off. That's just a huge advantage. Uh, on the other hand, we have right. and, and you see, Viserys you know, the first. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, if you look at uh, Jaehaerys the first, right, he gets one of his children married into House Aaron. That, you know, helps cement their loyalties. Yep. He also marries uh, one of his kids into House Baratheon, so there's that link there. You know, he's he's looking for great houses and making sure that he can build a sort of a national power block. Yes. Uh, so moving on, we have Viserys I, probably the one who arguably made the worst decisions with marriages, including his own. Uh, and he set up the Dance of the Dragons, even though the problems he caused didn't affect his own reign so much. They were kind of something he'd left for his successor. <laughs> yeah, I mean the 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 problem with dyna or the issue with dynastic alliances is that you have to make them uh, work with one another. You know, the, you're dealing with potentially rival houses. So Viserys's problem is that he marries into House Aaron, doesn't have a son. And then marries, or uh, at least a son that lives, uh, and then doesn't, and then marries into the High Towers. And now you have two competing lines. That if he'd yeah. been a little bit, if he'd been a little bit luckier with his children, or a little bit more careful about which houses he was marrying into and what they were expecting from their marriages, that he might have had a better time of it. Then we have Aegon V, of course, Makar's son, who would eventually sit the throne. And he had a seemingly good plan for marriages. He looked like he was going to make a bunch of marriages that were going to be good for peace. But, of course, his children all refused to accept them, and that caused the opposite problem. We, all, we had all kinds of fallout from Egg's children refusing to marry. But that is clearly outside of the scope of this episode. But it's good to be reminded of that. You can see how many ways this can go. Now, so Ardaeron did rely on marriages as much as any king, Targaryen king, as far as we can tell. The peace with Dorne, like I said, was built almost entirely on these marriages. His own, his sister Daenerys's, and his sons, even though, it, even though his sons didn't all marry Dornish people, they did marry important houses that helped keep the peace. So that is our next step here. We're going to work on part five. But first, a little preamble to that. The uneasy peace may have had the opposite effect. Where it's an interesting thing how people don't always want peace, and the people who didn't want peace, who were being forced into it, well, they had somewhere else to go. So we can say that maybe Dorne, uh, the Daemon, Daron came out ahead in the long run because the peace did stick. We all know where things are now. Dorne is a part of the realm. But did Daron cause 
or at least exacerbate the problems of the Blackfire Rebellions. Because even though Doran stayed in the realm, there were five generations of Blackfire Rebellions. Yeah, that's a high price to pay. Yeah, so we, we're going to have to examine that and see what kind of mistakes Daron made. After all, the Redgrass Field happened 13 years into Daron's reign. It's not like it just broke out right away, right after Aegon died. So that'll be part five. But real quick here, uh, interesting segue. Come on, we're, we're looking for creative ways to help the show become a professional endeavor, and this is a, maybe a little unusual, but it's effective. Uh, we have a new way to help the show. You go to historyofwesteros.com. If you are the, uh, a fan of fantasy sports, you can play daily fantasy sports. You can even play with me. If you sign up through our link, it says play daily DFS. Play daily fantasy sports with Aziz. The bottom right of historyofwesteros.com's front page. If you sign up, let us know and send me an email. Send me your username. We can play a little, we can play a little one-on-one games if you want. It'd be kind of fun to, to compete with me for just small stakes, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, whatever. Fun stuff. Anyway, we get a small cut of anyone who signs up through that, so that's a good way to support the show if that is your thing. But onward, part five, a forced peace. This is where things really come down because yeah. this Relationship with Dorne is probably the most important factor here. Uh, we'll we'll see. It's 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 if it, if it's not the most important, it's tied. Definitely in the top two. Yeah. Yes. Uh, quote: One of his one of his earliest significant acts after assuming the throne was to begin negotiations with his good brother Prince Maron to unify Dorne under Targaryen rule. Two years of negotiation later, an agreement was reached in which Prince Maron agreed to be betrothed to Daron's sister Daenerys once she was of age. They were wed the following year, and with that marriage, Prince Maron knelt and swore his oaths of fealty before the Iron Throne. So this period of a forced peace we're discussing is the, the uh, time of 187 to 196. 187 was the year that Maron married Daenerys. So in addition to clearing up his father's corruption as best as he could, Daron did through peace what his forebears could not accomplish through war, even when they had dragons. There was much credit given to the seven gods and to Baylor the Blessed, perhaps the man most responsible for breaking the cycle of violence and starting this whole ball rolling. Uh, he started off by marrying our Daron to Princess Mariah, as we said, and probably expected more marriages to seal the peace tighter, but Baylor died... Uh, you know, before he could accomplish a lot of these things. He wasn't very old. And the next Targaryen Martell marriage came, didn't come for another 20 years after Daron's marriage. So that was a little, probably longer than Baylor had in mind. But Daron was very clear as to who he credited with this. We have this quote. He proclaimed this as soon as the marriage vows were completed. Ba apparently, Daron II proclaimed, quote, Baylor, your work is done. And the World of Ice and Fire says that it was a great moment, at last unifying the realm from, wall, from the wall to the summer sea as Aegon the Conqueror had once dreamed. Um, one of the, the best things uh, symbolically to come out of the piece was the water garden, something that we are experiencing in the, in the current series. What do you think about the water gardens as a symbol, Stephen? Well, I mean, you know... If you think about it, the water gardens are a symbol of peace. Uh, they are a symbol of, uh, I mean, if you think about it, sort of uh, prosperity or bounty, I mean, especially in a desert climate, to have not just sort of water available, but so bount, sort of plentiful that you can use it for something other than drinking or, you know, keeping crops alive. Um, yeah. You know, and... Uh, it's it's even a symbol of of equality that uh, you know we have this quote from from Daenerys Targaryen in which she says to her son and heir you know this is your realm remember them in everything you do because when children are running around naked you can't tell who's a highborn and who's a lowborn. I love that little I love that little tidbit. Doran Martell's a good guy, huh? <laughs> um, but meanwhile, Daron had a, a peaceful sort of symbolic building project of his own in the works. I, I wouldn't say it's a par uh, a a parallel to the water gardens, but it is in a sense, mostly because it was built for a similar purpose, kind of to mark the peace, and it was also built around the same time. Uh, it's not normally what you think of, though, when you hear the name Summerhall. That was its original intent. It's kind of, now you think of Summerhall, it's like, whoa, this great tragedy, this great mystery, this, the, trying to rehatch dragons and the deaths of some really important historical figures. But originally, it was... A, a place of peace. It's a palace, not really a castle. We have this. We have this quote here. 
when it was completed in 188, a year after the marriage. Daron grazed a great... grazed. <laughs> Daron was also a horse. Daron raised a great seat in the Dornish marches, near to where the boundaries of the Reach, the Stormlands, and Dorn met. Calling it Summerhall to mark the peace he had created, it was more palace than castle and lightly fortified at best. So he's got a palace, a peace, marriages, children. Things are looking pretty good for Daron, but as we know, things went wrong. Basically, every single one of these positive things we just talked about had a negative side. They all had a downside. Nothing went over perfectly. Starting with this, quote, However, Prince Maron had won a few concessions in the accord, and the Lords of Dorne held significant rights and privileges that the other great houses did not. The right to keep their royal title first among them but also the autonomy to maintain their own laws, the right to assess and gather the taxes due to the Iron Throne with only irregular oversight from the Red Keep and other such matters. Dissatisfaction at these concessions was one of the seeds from which the first Blackfire Rebellion sprang, as was the belief that Dorne held too much influence over the king. For Daron II brought many Dornishmen to his court, some of whom were granted offices of note. So a lot of people hate the Dornish, and the Dornish get to marry into the royal family, and they get special treatment in running the realm. This tale of disgruntlement kind of sells itself. It's kind of obvious to see why some of these mm -hmm. lords were so upset. So that's when we really start to question Daron. Do you think that he shouldn't have allowed this special treatment? See, what do you th do? You think this was a mistake on his part, or was it necessary to get Dorn in the realm? Or I mean, I think offering concessions was necessary to give them to Dorn. I think the mistake was more not spreading it around more. Mm. That if he had given these concessions to other lords paramount and other lords in general, um, you know, or you know, not necessarily just sort of doing it blanket across the kingdom because that's a lot of power given away. Yes. But you know, if he'd at least kind of held it out as a quid pro quo, that he could have kind of allowed people to see that this this new sort of status is something that they themselves can have. You know, you, uh, there's an old quote. Uh, from LBJ that it's always better to have someone uh, inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the problem is that, you know, it's it's not that making these these agreements was necessarily a bad thing. It's that when you restrict it to just one group of people, it means that only that group of people are going to be your allies. Mm -hmm. And everyone else now has a grievance. That's a very good point. So he probably drove away some of, his, some of those people that came to his camp, either because of his father being crappy or because they right. just wanted to attach themselves to the future king, he may have driven some of them away by setting the Dornish above them and by, by some of his other behaviors. We have this, we, we mentioned the, the aspect of him having, quote, too much Dornish influence. And one quote uh, on that, going beyond that, it wasn't just that he had too many Dornish people around. Quote, Daron surrounded himself with maesters, septons, and singers. We've all heard that before. That's not who kings are supposed to surround themselves with. That's not what, I mean, I'm using the word supposed in terms of what Westerosi want. You know, obviously, personally, I think that's cool. But <laughs> uh, from a point of view of the lords and knights of Westeros, that's just unmasculine. It's not kingly yeah. to do these sort of things. And, so and I was, think eh. the larger... The larger problem is that it means that no one has... Uh, a lot of people among the lords and knights don't have a vested interest in his monarchy. Yes. Uh, and, and this is where I sort of see a, a parallel with Jon Snow, which is they're both pushing a, a, a sort of a revolution in thinking. You yes. Know, John is trying to bring in the wildlings. Daron is trying to bring in the Dornish. It's kind of both ends of the kingdom, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but what they're not doing is building a constituency around them, you know, a majority coalition in support of these reforms. You know, that it's if true. you had brought in, you know, yes, obviously, you know, if Dorne is now going to be part of the realm, they need a seat on the small council. But why not give a seat in the small council to the Tyrells? Why not give a seat to the Lannisters? Why not, you know, bring it, you know, or the Aarons? Why not bring in more of the realm? who have a vested interest in this new order of things continuing, as opposed to leaving them outside with nothing to gain from this. I agree with that. And let's, let's take it a step further here. A main point of favor, it's, it's considered a positive thing, and I wouldn't entirely, I would mostly agree with this, is that 
quote, without the, that, rather, that Daron brought Dorn into the realm, quote, without the terrible cost of life that Daron the Second's namesake, the young dragon, had paid. But there's a problem with this interpretation. Like Stephen just said, the piece didn't completely work. And we titled, that's why we titled this part, A Forced Piece, because there were far too many who just didn't want it. A large number of lords, knights, and others, quote, began to look more and more to the, quote, old days when Dornish men were the enemy to fight, not rivals for the king's attention or largesse. On right. the other hand... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, and I, I write about this in, in the first essay I did on the Blacks and Reds, which is that huge cost of life that Darren yes. the First had, had incurred, those are people's relatives. Those are their fathers and their brothers and their uncles and their cousins. And with a piece that's kind of so on one side, you know, in terms of, I mean, you know, the Targaryens get a lot out of the piece. No one else really does. <laughs> and so there's no sort of reckoning for these losses. There's no kind of way for people to grieve and deal with it. And, you know, I, I think of, you know, look at all the violence that happened during the War of, of Five Kings. Yeah. You know, people aren't ready to make peace on that unless there's some way of making sense of those deaths unless there's something that they can sort of look to to say, this is what my relative, you know, my, my father, my son, my brother, whatever, that they died for. Uh, and this is what gives their life meaning. And I think that's where Daron screwed up, is that he didn't, he didn't give them a, a, an understanding of the world that they could use to mm. help them grieve. That makes sense. Now... So, we're, like we were saying, a lot of the things that Daron did, they had a downside, or they turned bad. Summerhall, of course, is a perfect example, although that was entirely out of his control. We, don't, we can't blame him for that. Uh, but the other thing about these marriages, we're going to talk about his, his, his sons in particular, his strategy with who he married them to. The thing that is apparent with all of them was that, that none of them were Targaryen-style marriages, and there's probably two reasons for this. He may have been against the incest tradition in the first place, because we see that with a lot of the pious Targaryen kings because they follow the seven, and the seven are very against incest. But also, there's the politics. You don't get, there's no political advantage by marrying your children to each other. They could get away with that a lot more when they had the dragons and they didn't have to worry about the political advantages as much. But now that's such a, a constant consideration. As we see later in the Targaryen line, they went back to the brother-sister marriage, but this was kind of an era where that was done less. So let's take a look at some of these things, uh, some of these marriages and his, his, uh, his strategy for these, very specifically, uh, the, as well as some of the things that are given up by going this route. For one thing, there's this, this elevated status thing that they fall off with. Before, it was like a weird kind of duality where the most of the people in the realm are against incest, yet the Targaryens were allowed to get away with it because they're the Targaryens. That's Everyone just kind of saw it that way. They're above everyone else. They're kind of like demigods. Daron was kind of giving that up. He was kind of setting that aside, and that kind of made the Targaryens a little more human, which and especially kind of undermined their power lose, a little. Especially when you lose the Targaryen look. Yes, that's huge. That, you know, the marrying brother to sister, I mean, that was that used to be done to sort of keep the whole dragon riding magic thing going. But now it's got a role to play in that the symbols of, you know, white hair and purple eyes are now symbols of royalty. And you're kind of losing that a little bit. That is true. And it's also, uh, looking at the other side of this, you see, Damon, this, this also just pushes more people towards Damon Blackfire because... A, Damon has the symbol of Blackfire, very, a, a symbol that gains so much more in value without the dragons and without with the Targaryen look having more meaning. So the Blackfire is just so much more important than it used to be. And it's... Damon's already kind of got that above demigod thing going for him. Right. He's got He's the Targaryen the look. Yeah, the, the freaking, you know, Adonis, you know, uh, abilities and, and look and all that. So... And he's the product of incest, too, <laughs> even though his parents weren't and, married. So it's weird how he's a bad... It's, it's weird how that can actually play to his advantage, <laughs> in Damon's case, and against Daron, the, the incest thing. It's, yeah. it's kind of backwards. So, but speaking to what you said about the look as well, 
it's like a, the future could be seen. Baylor Breakspear didn't look Targaryen. Baylor's sons didn't look Targaryen. Baylor's eldest son was Valar, and Valar had a little streak of silver, kind of like Darkstar almost. But that was the only real nod but, uh, to his Targaryen sure. look. <laughs> not not, Dark not more secret Targaryen. <laughs> got way too many of them. Yeah, no, I do not believe, for the record, I do not believe Darkstar is a secret Targaryen. But, yes. but a Valar had, I believe Valar also only had blue eyes. So he, he really just, was, the Targaryen look was kind of fading. But it ended up going through Makar after all. And that kind of kept the gold, silver, and purple going. So let's look at these marriages specifically, though. Uh, first of all, so, so Daron's strategy was kind of a mix of marrying his sons to important Dornish houses and to marcher houses uh, or other houses that were important to him. But you can kind of see a bit of a funny pattern. Baylor and Makar were the kind of the choice sons. Baylor because right. he's the heir and because he's a great fighter, and Makar because he's a great fighter and looked Targaryen. Uh, so Baylor was married to Jenna Dondarrion. A Dondarian. Now, the Dondarians, of course, are an ancient marcher house that have been fighting the Dornish for thousands of years. So, by giving his heir to the marchers, he was saying, hey, look, I'm balancing this out. I'm married to the Dornish, but my son here is married to the ancient Dornish enemy. So, that was probably a good decision, don't you think? Yeah, no, that makes sense as a, uh, a balancing act. It's, again, it's that building the coalition. Right, and then we also have Makar was married to Diana Dane. So Makar was married to a Dane. That was a great revelation from the world of Ice and Fire. And we don't know what, what Diana looked like, but she probably looked like... A, the, the Danes tend to look at least somewhat Targaryen, not as extreme, but they have the purple eyes frequently. They have the, you know, maybe not silver gold hair, but like ash and, you know honey colors, like the milder versions of silver and gold. Uh, which is interesting because Makar's firstborn son didn't look terribly Targaryen. He had sandy hair and a blonde beard, but he definitely had the dragon dreams, so he was... <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it didn't, had didn't that. work out for, you know, Egg and Arion uh, certainly do have the full Targaryen look going on. That's true, yes. Uh, so the, the, the genetics mostly stayed strongly Targaryen, but we don't want to get too deep into that. Um, we, but the point being that Daron was very aware of how, at least, maybe not very aware, but at least somewhat aware of how some of these people would get upset based on these new alliances and how he had to balance it out. So I would say that he had the right idea, but he didn't go far enough. Like you said, he didn't bring the Tyrells to the table. He didn't bring the Lannisters to the table. Yeah. He, he, he did bring some of these people to the table, but not enough of them. Right, and if you look at these houses, they're not great houses. They're, I, I don't mean that it, they suck. I mean, <laughs> they are lesser houses. The Dondarians, the Penroses, the, the Danes, I mean, with the exception of the Aarons, uh, who right. we haven't talked about yet. He's not, you know, if you, he's not reaching very high. If you get the, the Tyrells on your side, if you get uh, you know, the, the Lannisters on your side, those are houses that can bring tens of thousands of soldiers. They have you know, they, they speak with a, 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 a powerful voice in great councils. Uh, so, you know, he's not kind of... He's having a regional impact. He's not having a national impact, for the most part. I mean, the, the Aaron marriage aside, I think that's the kind of the one exception. And that, he, he really does kind of uh, strike lucky. That's a good point. The next two marriages were to his less impressive sons. Uh, Ares was married to Eleanor Penrose, and Regal was married to, I forget which Aaron, but to... Uh, uh, Aaron. Alice? Alice, yes, you're right. Alice, Aaron. And, but we're not sure that those marriages actually happened before the Redgrass Field. A bunch of Penroses died. All but one child, a uh, male child of the Penroses, died during the Redgrass Field. So we're more maybe leaning towards the idea that they got the marriage to Ares kind of as a reward. But also we know that Eleanor... Uh, Eleanor Penrose, who married Ares, was Ares' cousin, although we're not exactly sure how. That's a whole other thing that we don't want to get into. But uh, it's it's deeper than that. Uh, with Aaron, with the Aaron marriage, Ray, like we said, Rhaegal, they get the Aarons get this crazy Targaryen prince, which is nice, I guess. Maybe not their he wouldn't have been their first pick, but considering the Aarons were already hyper loyal, I guess they didn't need to have 
you know, this shining star prince as they're, you know, brought into their family. But, this, like I said, this marriage could have happened after the Red Grassfield, too. Yeah, and, and they're I'm already sure. kin to begin with. Yes. So sort of, you know, they're, they're, to a certain extent, they are less... Uh, they're less up for grabs. They're they're not exactly free agents, so you can. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't you ne- you don't need to woo them as much as you might other houses. So, but there's this this kind of this overwhelming sentiment. Oh, we'll actually get back up for a second. Makar definitely married Deanna Dane before the black uh, before the red grass field. We know that much, and the Danes were probably somewhat important. It made a color their coloration may have had a may have bit, played part of the role in that decision, but. The Danes are a fairly important house in Dorne, and they're on the other side of Dorne from the Martells. It may have been a regional thing going on. They want to make sure they have that area covered. But for that reason, we're you know 99% sure that the Danes fought for Daron during the uh, during the war. Um, but just like we talked about how there's the Selmies and the Karens and the Don like before the Dondarians got married to, to Daron. All these other marcher houses that just hate the Dornish. They don't want to stop fighting them. They're not thrilled with right. this idea. You hear them think, hear them saying things like, if I can't fight the Dornish, how will I earn glory? All their ancestors are, and there's so many of their ancestors that are famous, they're known, that have songs sung about them because they fought the Dornish. This is a complete, like, thousands of years of lifestyle that they're just giving up. They're, they're losing it. We have this quote here from Aris Okart. He was a man of the reach, and the Dornish were his ancient foes, as the tapestries at Old Oak, Old Oak bore witness. Ares only had to close his eyes to see them still. Lord Edgerin, the open-handed, seated in splendor with the heads of a hundred Dornishmen piled round his feet, the three leaves and the prince's pass, pierced by Dornish spears, Alistair, sounding his war horn with his last breath, Sir Olivar, the green oak, all in white, dying at the side of the young dragon. Dorn is no fit place for any oak heart. Perfect example of how even yeah. though the piece is hundreds of years old, 120-ish years old, that there's these memories are still very strong in the minds of these of these families that, that yeah, move and uh, you know, and we can see some some real world historical parallels here. I mean, especially Alistair sounding the war horn with his last breath. I mean, that's that's a pretty clear uh, parallel to um, Roland and the, yeah. the Chanson de Roland, and which again. That's about a battle in the mountains between, you know, France and Spain, which at the time, you know, was was under the the control of the Moorish. So you know, there is that kind of uh, historic, you know, uh, resemblance going on. Yeah, George is certainly a fan of history, and it shows through things like this. There's all these little things that bleed through. Uh, and speaking of, of of in-world history, though, we have another character that everyone knows, Prince Oberyn Martell, had his own quote relating to these ancient grievances that is, I think is, is illuminating. It goes like this. In Dorne of old, before we married Daron, it was said that all flowers bow before the sun. Should the roses seek to hinder me, I'll gladly trample them underfoot. So... Old habits die hard, we say, even amongst those who weren't even alive during these periods of, of the most of greatest enmity, they're still passed on. It's like it literally stays in their blood. <laughs> so, but there's only uh, so much a king can do on his own, and other is part of the point here. These ancient grievances, there's, what can Daron do about that? There's only so much. He, he, it's almost like he just has to wait, keep these guys in check, and, and let these generations die off and just try to reach the new generations and try to make them peaceable. You just can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, and back, and this all dates back again to his father. Mm-hmm. We have another quote. As Daron's major problem here, the seeds of war, of course, can be credited and are credited to his father. In truth, the seeds found fertile ground because of Aegon the Unworthy. Aegon had hated the Dornish and warred against them, and those lords who desired the return of those days, despite all the associated misrule, would never be happy with this peaceable king. That kind of says it all, doesn't it? Some people just want to fight. We've been fighting there thousands of years, and that's how it should be. I hope we keep fighting forever. It sounds ridiculous, but to us modern, peaceful people that live you know, where we live now, where it's just kind of... It just kind of blows the mind. But it's important to take a look at things from the other side. Stephen, let's take a look at how the Dornish felt about all this. There's just as many people on the Dornish side that wanted to keep right. fighting too, aren't there? Uh, for, let me start it off with a quote here. The disunity, the disunity of the Dornish is apparent even from our oldest sources. 
the great distances between each pocket of settlement and the difficulties of travel across burning sands and rugged mountains help to isolate each small community from all the others. The point of that is, just because the Martells married the throne and a couple other houses got in on it doesn't mean the rest of Dorne is excited about this. Right. So on the other side, just like there's Karens and Tarleys and Selmys who wanted to keep on fighting, there's Dornish houses like the, like the Fowlers of Skyreach, the Blackmonts of Blackmont, the Manwoodies of Kingsgrave and the Wiles of Wile and the Ironwoods of Ironwood. They wanted to keep on killing marchers rather than making peace with them. We've got another quote that, that speaks to this from the other side. I mentioned him a minute ago, Darkstar, and this, mm -hmm. is, this is him. What I know is that Danes have been killing Oakarts for several thousand years. His arrogance took our breath away. It seems to me that Oakarts have been killing Danes for just as long. We all have our family traditions. <laughs> ah, Darkstar. He is of the night. <laughs> he is Darkwing Duck. He is dark, dark way to talk. Okay, so as we move into part six, we're, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end here. We've only got two hours. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, so we're going to make this brief. Uh, remember that you can do shopping on Amazon.com through History of Westeros. We have a bunch of links on the right side of our front page, and it's a great way to support the show. You will not pay any additional money for any shopping you do at Amazon.com, but we do get a small cut of any of that, so if you're going to shop there anyway, might as well help us out, right? Okay. Part six, the Great Bastards. Most of what we're going to talk about with the Great Bastards, we're going to devote with their individual episodes. There's going to be a Bittersteel episode. It's going to be a Damon Blackfire episode. It's going to be a Blood Raven episode. So just real quickly, we're going to cover what how Daron tried to handle them before they were of age and uh, to set things up. So, although he could not and would not rescind his father's last wishes, he did what he could to keep the Great Bastards close, treating them honorably and continuing the incomes that the king had bestowed on them. Not a bad idea to keep them happy, uh, I suppose, but was it enough, or did he go too far? So, what do you think, Stephen? Um, we're, we're going down to some of these issues here. Like, what do you think with his handling of Damon and, and, and allowing him to have a castle and going through with his marriage that he went through? What do you think? Was, did, he, did he handle it well, or did he, did he screw it up? My position with, with Darren is that I feel like he tries to have things both ways, and that doesn't always work out very well. So, for example, you know, he, he gives Daemon this land, he gives him, allows him to build a castle, um, but then you get this conflict over, uh, over Daenerys. And, you know, this kind of, you know, um, one of the things that historians always talk about with revolutions is that they almost never happen when things are at their worst. They usually happen when things have gotten better and then suffered a reversal. And it seems like that with a lot of the great bastards, that, you know, he gave Daemon just enough of the, the taste of the good life that he came to expect it. And then when he got crossed, he felt like it's not that so he reached for something out of his reach. It's more that he felt that something that he deserved, something that was rightfully his, mm -hmm. had been taken away from him. I mean, especially in the case of uh, Daenerys. And now we also talked about, earlier we talked a bit about why Bittersteel would be upset, so we don't need to re-go re over that too much, but it, it seems likely that from Daron's point of view, he probably didn't like Bittersteel much himself. It seems like they would probably, they both had reasons to dislike each other. Uh, Daron may have resented the Brackens for their attempts to push him out of the way and his mother out of the way. That, that, that is an emotional thing, and even though B Bittersteel was just a child, he could still have a grudge towards the Brackens for that. On the other hand, we have Bloodraven. Uh, Brendan Rivers. They're both scholarly types, and they seem to get along. Obviously, Bloodraven was a loyalist and remained a loyalist, and eventually became hand for King Ares, Daron's son. Um, he may have been gifted with Dark Sister as part of this this uh, keeping the Great Bastards loyal. We don't actually know when yeah. he first acquired Dark Sister, though. It may have been a reward for the Redgrass Field. He may have had it ahead of time. The only thing we know for sure is that he had it by about 204, but that's seven years after the war. Mm -hmm. So it's probably more fun to assume he had it during the war. Then we get to imagine him fighting Bittersteel, Blackfire versus Dark Sister. But we'll talk about that a little more in their own episode since we are fast running out of time here. Je real quick, Stephen, general grade on his handling of the Great Bastards. What do you think? Do you think he did a j good job, or do you think he could have done a little better? I think... Ultimately, he, he screwed up. He tried to have things both ways. Mm. And that, you know, 
I mean, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here of the sort of the discussions of the small council in dealing with Daenerys. It's not a nice thing to do, but you know, either make someone your friend or kill them. Don't try to do things <laughs> both ways. You know, both ways. That you know, you if you make da Daemon powerful enough that alienating him can lead to a civil war, you've just caused problems for yourself. You haven't solved anything. So you know, either kind of go with them all the way and make sure that they are as loyal to you as they can be or eliminate them completely so that they can't possibly pose a threat to you. Yeah, it doesn't seem like Daron was cutthroat enough for that. It seemed like he was a little too nice for, to be to take those kind of steps. He didn't have that kind of cold streak like Tywin or Stannis, like doing what had to be done because of the dangers. Uh, what's interesting, though, to complicate matters, though, is you talk about um, how important it would have been for him to make friendships. It seemed like a friendship with Bitter Steel was just out of the question. Damon, however, there is a decent bit of evidence that they that Daron liked Damon. There's there's a mention of him finding fond he was being fond of him in a lot of ways, and I can see that Damon was a very charismatic guy. Even though like he could I could see Daron blaming his father for the problems and saying, oh, this child is innocent. Even though eventually they came to be at odds when they were younger together, it may have been different. And, and that, may, and that makes the whole thing more tragic. Yeah, they grew up together, exactly. And right, I mean, there's a difference there with Bittersteel, which is that, you know, Bittersteel was in exile. He would have known, you know, Damon, Damon's entire life. Yeah, and that's, uh, and, and so that, that can go a lot of ways. When you, people you grow up with, you, it can go well, it can not do well, but you you definitely can have an opinion one way or the other. <laughs> it's uh, you're not going to just be like, oh, uh, I don't know anything about him. No, you grew up with somebody, you're you're going to have an opinion. These things are really going to matter, especially when you grow up at court in a position where in a place where there's ambition and power floating all over the place and being pulled in multiple directions. Okay, the last few things. One uh, thing that I think is really fun is we talk about a lot of these topics and we talk about kind of what ifs, what could have happened what might have been. Well, one way that this can be played out is by gaming. One of my favorite games and I that I've ever played in my life is Crusader Kings 2. And we've talked about it briefly on the show before, and it has it's a wonderful game set in uh, the medieval periods. You can play a number of different times, and it has a, there's a mod out there that you can find links to on our forum. And it is it turns the game into uh, Westeros. It turns it into Westeros and Essos, and you can even replay the Blackfire Rebellions with this game by yep. taking control of Damon Blackfire or Bitter Steel. Or have you played this game much, Steve? Uh, I have, in fact, not only have I played this game, I tried to win the Blackfire Rebellion as Damon Blackfire. Did you not succeed? So successful. Oh but no! <laughs> I, I was just—it was my first experience with Crusader Kings 2, and I didn't really oh, okay. understand. A word to the warning. It's a fun game, but it is very complicated, and you need to know, uh, you need to learn, especially uh, dynastic claims and oh, yeah. rules of succession. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> you just don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Shay and I have both spent plenty of time on that game. I recommend it for people that have plenty of time to kill, because it is a time sink. Uh, you can actually purchase it through our site. Go to historyofwesteros.com, and it's on the on the right in the sidebar, Crusader Kings 2. And like I said, you can find the mod through our forums. There are lots of links to it, or you can just type Crusader Kings Game of Thrones mod in Google, and you'll find it that way. But this is yet another way to support the show and have a lot of fun in the meantime. Okay, we got to wrap things up. Thanks again. Uh, we, we have I have a one last uh, one or two little things to say here before we get out of here. We only have a couple minutes left. Uh, the story of Daron doesn't end here. Daron's fate will be discussed later as part of our coverage of what happened after the final conflict of the first Blackfire Rebellion, the Battle of Redgrass Field. So next in the series on the road to Redgrass is the man who epitomizes all the complaints against King Daron, the man who represented the solution to so many problems plaguing the realm, the man who was to many. Seeing the way Bran saw Jaime early in a Game of Thrones quote, this is what a king should look like. The Black Dragon himself, the king who bore the sword, Damon Blackfire. All right, thanks, Stephen, for, for joining us today. It was really awesome having you. You're obviously very knowledgeable about this topic. It was great to be able to go back and forth without uh, having to do uh, to script every line. It was, it was wonderful to, to talk to somebody that has really deep knowledge of the subject. So uh, tell everybody again where to find your essays. Okay, uh, you can go to racefortheironthrone.wordpress.com. Uh, you can look me up on Tumblr. I do a lot of sort of writing there, uh, racefortheironthrone.tumblr.com. Uh, and you can look at my essays on Tower of the Hand. 
Great. Um, last, real quick, we have our, uh, for, for $2 a month on Patreon, you can get each episode one day early. Uh, that's a way to join the History of Westeros Army. And I want to thank those people who are our top Patreon supporters. Uh, Hand of the King, Lord Cash Craig, a.k.a. Vaxus, on the History of Westeros forums. Our Warden of North is Lord Parker, the Bastard of Starkville. We do not have any other Wardens at this time. Those spots are open. The Master of Coin is Lord Robert Jacobs. The Master of Whispers, Lord James the Scholar. Grand Maester Itai wears the jeweled collar of many medals. Rosie the Clever is our Master of Laws. And Lord James Tuttle is our Master of Ships. The History of Westeros Night's Watch Lord Commander is Lord Commander George the Golden. History of Westeros Kingsguard, commanded by Lord Commander Shepard. We have Sir Andrew the Prophet, Sir Paul Greenhand, Sir Dolores D, and Sir Lars Penry. As the rest of the Kingsguard, there are still a couple open spots. Valor Morgalis means all men must die, and so do all episodes of History of Westeros come to an end. So until next time, folks, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.